policy research. I'll just take you through the rules once again. The chairperson will begin with the opening remarks, and then each of the two speakers will then express their views individually. The given time is about eight to nine minutes, post which there will be a group discussion. After that, as you all know, the floor will be open for a Q&A session. Over to you, ma'am, to take over. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be chairing this session. Uh, it's a fairly important session, and yes, we have our uh, final speaker, Mr. Arindatar. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, part of uh, this panel of eminent lawyers uh, who are here. And the topic for today that um, the panel will be speaking on is, do our law schools produce world-class lawyers? Um, I was here at uh, uh, this uh, conclave earlier in the day, and we heard the uh, session on healthcare and education of girls. And um, you know, when we saw the video of uh, you know where the, the person was carrying the dead body of his wife without access to healthcare, you really think of whether um, you know law, law school or law education is that urgent. Certainly, primary school education and Healthcare are uh, such glaring uh, needs, but really, at the end of the day, uh, if we want to protect our rights, our right to healthcare, right to education, right to dignity, we have to go to the courts and the lawyers and the judges. And so, therefore, the question becomes all the more important: that what are our law schools producing? So, first, I'd like to ask: what do we really mean by world-class lawyers? What should be the kind of lawyers that our law schools should produce? Our law schools go on to produce lawyers, law practitioners, judges, government officers, ministers, politicians, teachers, and scholars. And in all their roles, we are practicing the law, interpreting the law, changing the law, using the law, and enacting law. And so therefore, there is, I would say, a very important relationship between legal education, the practice of law, and the functioning of our legal system. Now, in this regard, if law schools and legal education has such an important role to play in how law is practiced and how our legal system functions, then what should it be that our law schools should be doing or should be producing? Now, there are two schools of thought that are there. One school of thought is that um, there are some legal educators who believe that law schools should be like an academic department of any university like any academic department, where it should be research and knowledge. Uh, that should be pursued. Um, there should be you know, research, knowledge, scholarship, and uh, you know, the pursuit of truth. That should be the main intellectual activity. In other words, students should be learning the law. There is another school of thinking. And that school of thinking, uh, that school of thought, believes that the law school is a professional school. Like medical school. It produces, it should produce lawyers who are going to go and practice. Uh, it should prepare its graduates to be competent practitioners who should know about the legal profession. That's what they need to produce. Now I'd like to give you, uh, so, th so there were these, there, there are these two dividing, uh, often dividing viewpoints that should you be really learning the law and, you know, learning the nitty gritties of the law and, you know, really uh, enjoying the, uh, you know, what, what the law is in, in, in its in-depth uh, uh, analysis, or should you just be focusing on creating competent practicing lawyers and know the rules of the court, how to argue in court, how to litigate, and how to address a case? I just want to give you an example. When I graduated from law school, the first day I joined uh, the office of a very uh, senior lawyer. And on my first day of work, I was sent to court on a case. I was given a file and asked, um, go and argue this matter. It's an Order 39A case. I mean, embarrassing enough, I had no idea what the lawyer told me. I had no idea what Order 39 was, what part of the law it was, which law it was. I went to court, and when I went to court, I started addressing the judge when I said, Your Honor, the first, just as I said, Your Honor, the first thing the judge told me is, 
you're standing on the wrong side. You are the defendant, stand the other side. So neither did I know how to practice, nor did I know the substantive law. So both these situations, at least I feel uh, our, law our law schools are not equipping our law students to uh, be competent at when they come out. To this, I would like to add a third dimension. A third dimension really that I would like to add, in, that we must explore, is the connection between legal education and public interest. Ultimately, legal education should be the pursuit to uh, pursuit of justice, or should be in the interest of justice. And when we talk of legal education and public interest, uh, I'm talking about what are our law schools teaching law students about social justice issues, about issues that our world is facing today, about inequality, injustice, and how should they pursue uh, their legal profession and legal career. Do our, law school, uh, do our law students, when they come out of law school, do they know that majority of the poor actually do not have access to courts? They cannot afford lawyers. And if they cannot afford lawyers, how are they going to get adequate representation? How many uh, law graduates, when they come out of law school, really even think of pursuing or being a legal aid lawyer or doing legal aid work? I think most law graduates, when they come out, they want to join um, very snazzy corporate law firms because those are the co you know, glamorous jobs and uh, you know, um, envisage themselves doing uh, corporate law work. So how do we then produce law students? How do our law schools then produce law graduates who will take up cases of public interest, who will take up cases of women, children, people with disabilities, people of sexual minorities, people who cannot afford lawyers, uh, and take up social justice issues in their profession? Um, I think these, this certainly is an issue that our law schools have to address. They are not addressing it adequately. And uh, with that, I end, and I hope some of these questions will be taken up by uh, uh, the other panelists. Thank you. My dear young children, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Indian Express. Thank you, Dr. Vaidya. <laughs> Acquisition of knowledge versus impregnation of knowledge. That's the choice in deciding whether you evolve experts or you evolve the average. It's very interesting. In fact, the it gave us an opportunity to explore how legal education has progressed and how uh, the legal frontiers of education have progressed. Take the input-output mismatch. Legal education in India was pre-British, pre-independence period, was confined to the affluent families who could go to London and do law. Then take the Supreme Court from 1950 to 2016. The vintage classic judgments, you will find it in the first 25 to 30 years. You will find the best legal luminaries arguing the best constitutional points. So, they have never had formal education the way we wanted, in, in, in the prototype way we have aspired for it. They got educated. They took to practice, they interacted with judges of eminence, and they could get the best in the form of judgments, laying down the path for the nation. This has been the roadmap of practicing law. Let's understand the roadmap of academic institutions. We never had full-time colleges, we never had full-time teachers, Whenever you normally say, why are you a lawyer? Why are you a lawyer? We, we could not afford a, a seat anywhere else. No college afford, asked us to come, and therefore we are invited here, and therefore we are a lawyer by default. This was the foundation of legal education in India. And in its 60 years, 
we now have reached a stage of competitive education. Like engineering and law, students aspire to join law institutions. It's happening in the last five, ten years. Standardization has come. So there is a mismatch in the input-output ratio. You had eminent jurists, you had great judges, you had great judgments. Even today, after traveling enough from saying this, even today we have wonderful judges in the country and still have wonderful lawyers. But considering the academic progression and perfection which we have been trying to achieve in the last 60 years, is the output matching with the input? The answer certainly is no, because there is fallen standards. Why? And what can be done? Any professional excellence, any professional education, let's understand, especially children are here, you must understand it comes by nurturing. It comes by learning the craft through the road. You don't learn it through books. You need not necessarily learn it out through an institution. So, let's take two examples, the magnet and the needle. As long as the magnet is within the radius, it attracts the needle. But it cannot make the needle a magnet. A magnet shall ever remain a magnet and a needle shall ever remain a needle. This is the disability any institution which is institutionalized, has it, we, irrespective of the area of progress, irrespective of the area of academic uh, pursuit. You, you, this, has, this is the basic limitation. That's why our script, I've been learn, listening for the past one and, one and a half hours about ancient and modern. Our Gurukul, all these excelled eminent jurists and eminent judges have undergone not institutionalized Gurukula Vasakam, but a personal Gurukula Vasakam under their seniors. Why? Our scriptures say there is something called a philosopher's stone, sparsamani. What can it do? It, when it, it's gold, and when it touches a metal, it is capable of converting it to gold. That's the difference between magnet and a needle. A needle can never become a magnet, however much you may put an effort, unless otherwise there is a transmission of its through. Uh, 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 whereas in a, in, in a philosopher's stone. You just by intake, by just by glance, by just by pursuit, by contact, by action, by infusion, you can make one more philosopher's stone out of it. Now, how do we now do that in an institution? You can't say, therefore, all of you go to some gurukulam. It's not possible. You need degrees. You need academic uh, qualifications. You need, you need uh, graduations. You need to have some, some sort of... So how do we do it? See, today... The difference between 30 years and now, when we were the first batch of five-year integrated law in 1983 to 1988, now 30 years of 35 years have passed. Now the difference in the education is this, in legal education. What connects a university and a student? Let's take that very clearly. What connects the university and the student? Curriculum, conference, seminars, guest, guest lectures, mood courts, and in some universities, exchange programs. But what is required to produce, ex expert, to produce experts out of these institutions? The curriculum, the conference, seminar, all is all done in controlled conditions. They modulate your behavioral patterns. They infuse you some sort of an idea of what, how to progress in the profession. But they don't allow you to emulate an experience of expertise. I want to say these three E's. Emulation, experience, result is the expertise. Now how do we do these three? Is it possible in an institutionalized manner? I feel it is possible. Dr. Chandra was speaking yesterday on, he used an expression, I was told, fidgeted. It's not digital not technology. He used a nice expression, fidgetal. What do you mean by fidgetal? Find out the physical infrastructure and match it with technology. Bundle both together. 
and deliver it it is going to have an impact can we do that in legal education to produce experts let me tell you how what is the physical infrastructure available to you an institution we have now very good institutions in the country as much as we have some bad institutions too let's not worry about it see in public domain it's always better to talk in a positive manner and with young children here we should give them hopes so there are good institutions available today in the country for legal education be certain about it so once we that's the starting point now two you have eminent retired judges and eminent judges serving the uh, judiciary today eminent you have the resource you have eminent jurists 80 plus still 6 70 people are still there we asked they would have traveled three generations four generations of uh, legal pursuit you still have such experts and uh, below them you have still very good uh, a, a, a platform of uh, senior counsels across the country who have ex gained expertise in their various fields and professions of practice then you have good people public intellectuals available to contribute you on the social aspects can't we not videograph their experience it's difficult to bring them to each university and make them speak it's not possible so why don't we standardize and capture their best of experience and the best practices what they feel out of the experience is good to add value into your professional career then uh, make it available make it available for universities children to read and to listen watch and experience this is one area which you can this is possible you have the infrastructure you have to match it with the digital uh, uh, mode and then bring it to the campus of a university it's not going to be very difficult they will do it lovingly they are waiting for such uh, things people to reach to them to do that this is one area you can possibly think to produce expertise now the second area is we should cut down it's no use teaching them 35 subjects let them choose a few subjects they they understand how to need, read law 30 years back we had one moot competition in south and one moot competition in north today we have hundreds happening week after week at least 10 competitions happening across the country so they know how to read a law including uh, certain basic constitutional provisions these children are trained so don't dump them with too much of syllabus let them spend 50% on academics and 50% on experience instead of just going for a one month intern can they spend 3 to 4 months in courts in a, after the third year third fourth and fifth year second suggestion now the third suggestion is can we convert our examination systems to this these professional colleges into an open book system so that you don't have to really be worried about uh, uh, mugging up or trying to memorize when you have better ultimately it's enhancement of skill ultimately that is where we must work for not produce more people with academic marks so can you cut down the size of the uh, and subjects and the uh, and the and just give 50% for this and 50% for practicals third suggestion and the fourth suggestion in fact six months back when i was talking to the national judicial academy for judges this is what i when we have, have we have enough colleges across the country let these children be aligned with the respect to courts work on the basic file and they can really contribute in reducing dependency and in the process they will learn by experience these are all practical things if you work 10 files in a year who motivates you how does it motivate you what ultimately what motivates you is when you doing a click when you do a case my last two minutes we ultimately dish out four sets of people from and out of a law institution most of them join the corporates because it is attractive and there is a social immediate social recognition therefore there is a flair for corporate employment and i say corporate government going for employment in general the second space is for litigators who aspire to be in litigation the third space is for people who study and do research and the fourth one is for very few but rare but happens 
social activists. A few do become social activists after pursuing law. Now, at least for the three litigators and uh, people interested in in research and social activists, a legal education should fundamentally give them fundamentals. In the case of a litigator, creative thinking and advocacy. In the case of students interested in research, analytical thinking and global reach. In the case of a social activist, it's very, very fundamental and important that they must understand history, the value system, and social awareness. Their social awareness is just 15 years old, most of them. Where you require centuries of knowledge before you can become a social activist. So, these three is something which if an institution can give, you can produce experts not only as litigators. You produce good research scholars out of India. Our, please understand, it's a hope I'm giving to each one of you. Our judgments of the Supreme Court on various laws which has cross-border impact and analysis is being, our, our judgments of the High Court and Supreme Court is constantly discussed in international fora. This is a standard of judgments which has continuing to produce with good judges and with good counsels and with good cases coming up to courts. So all this is happening in India and it's opening up. We are having a lot of cross-border uh, and now you see group exchange studies are happening and people want us. So there is, there is a need from and out of India across the world. There is a lot of hope. We can produce, we should produce experts. And finally, one request to a lot of students here being here, I request you, if you want to be a good lawyer, you should be passionate about three things. It's a must. Only then you can grow yourself as a wholesome lawyer. You must love your country. Passion to the country is paramount. Two, passion to our culture. And three, we must integrate and invest our time in knowing our constitution more than anything else. These three C's, court, in, in court language there are three other C's. You should, not, you should never even hear it in your life. But we should substitute those three C's with these three C's. Country, culture and constitution. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody, and I must thank New Indian Express for inviting me to speak at this uh, topic. The question asked is, uh, do our law schools produce world-class lawyers? And without batting an eyelid, I can say yes, but not enough. We have very, very good world-class lawyers, but I wish we had many, many more of the world-class lawyers. Just a brief background, my friend Venkat Raman mentioned about how the law, entire profession of law has changed. Of course, when we look down of our history and our constitution and so on, we remember the great lawyers, you know, Motilal Nehru, Tej Bahadur Sapru, you had Alladi Krishnami Ayer, all these were great lawyers. But let us not forget at that point of time, law was not the profession of choice. Many people came to law college as a last resort. And I'm a student of the Madras Law College, and there used to be a joke that nobody would walk the footpath next to the law college in the early 40s and 50s because if they found you, they'll catch you and put into law college because nobody was <laughs> joining the law college. In fact, uh, after I did my BSc honors, I started getting involved in the law and I immediately, by choice, decided to take up law and cost accounting. And after I finished both, I had gone to my hometown in Pune and I told my aunt that I'm going to become a lawyer. I've decided to enroll, and she was absolutely horrified. And the first reaction was, who will marry you? you know? <laughs> so uh, that was the immediate reaction in Marathi. So from that place now, after the advent of the law schools in the late 80s and 90s, the, entire, the law has become, in many cases, a profession of choice. The salaries and the money you get matches other professions. See, no matter how much we talk about wisdom and culture and great values and so on, ultimately money is the driving force. Let us not mistake about it and let me tell all of you youngsters there is nothing wrong with money money well earned is the most noble thing that you can do so don't have this thing that money is bad and you know wisdom is good and all I don't believe in that absolute 
I think it's absolute rubbish and border dash. The definition of money is it is the harvest of productive work. And you earn the money in proportion to the services you render to society. And again, it's issue of demand and supply. So if your aim is to earn money, no problem. But only thing, remember, money should be the byproduct of your excellence and not should be the aim by itself. So coming back to the national law schools, I find that today the quality of the students who come are truly outstanding. I don't intend to flatter you because I get interns right through the year. And when I see those young boys and girls performing, they have capacity and knowledge which we did not have at the age of 30 and 35. So I find that the quality of the students are improving year after year. The only regret I have is many of them go into corporate jobs and not enough join the legal profession to practice. It's their personal choice. Again, at the age of 20, 24, if you get a very handsome salary, it's difficult not to be seduced by that. Nobody wants to wait for 10 years to settle in the bar. But I try to tell my young friends that, look, if you're willing to wait, then the rewards are enormous in terms of personal satisfaction and in terms of daily achievement. As a lawyer, tell, believe me, I don't have a single boring day in my life. Every day, I'm already planning next week what are the interesting cases to argue, what are the new strategies you adopt, and so on. So every day is a fascinating challenge as far as lawyers are concerned. Now, if you take the legal landscape, what is the position today? We have 17 lakh lawyers. I just spoke to the Bar Council of Tamil Nadu before I came, and I was told that there are roughly 17 lakh lawyers in the country and 90,000 lawyers in Tamil Nadu. Take the number of cases. As far as the statistics of 2012 are concerned, there are 2 crore 80 lakh cases throughout the country. That is 28 million. And out of these 28 million, 4 million are in the high courts. So 40 lakhs are in the high courts and 2.8 crores are in the lower courts, the district courts, the magistrate courts and so on. So it's a roughly a ratio of 6 is to 1. And I remember in a seminar, and, uh, Justice Venkatchalaya, one of our greatest chief justices, said that out of every 100 cases that go to a criminal court, hardly five ultimately reach the Supreme Court. So if you take the pattern of litigation, I think one problem which we have to address is how to produce very competent lawyers at the district court level and the subordinate court level. What happens is the best of the lawyers, they all want to go to the Supreme Court directly, which is, I think, a terrible mistake. You have to work your way up, but then this is a particular position which, is, which can't be ignored. Now, the other thing which I want to tell young students is, please do not be glamorized by a foreign education. I think today what happens to every law student is every law student wants to go and do a degree in LLM. It could be LLM in some Timbuktu University, but he wants to go abroad and do an LLM. Let me tell you that it is not necessary at all. And if you look back, when I wrote the book on Palkiwala, Courtroom Genius, he had come first class first. Palkiwala's record was he came first in every subject in all the years. So it's an unbroken record and it will never be broken. It can be equaled, but it cannot be surpassed. So there were six subjects in first year, six subjects in second year. So he came first class first in each subject in each year. And when he was told, he was a Parsi, he had the Dorab Tata Foundation, he could have got a scholarship for the asking. But he said, there is no need to go abroad, I'll stay back and do well. And believe me, I can give you example after example. You take Palkhewala, you take M.K. Nambiar, you take uh, Ram Jitpalani, K.K. Venugopal, Soli Sorabji, none of them have gone abroad and all are done splendidly well. I'm not saying that foreign education is bad, but I'm saying that that is not necessary to achieve professional excellence. So remember that, and I personally believe in so spending two years abroad, A, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your father's money, you would perhaps be better off by doing work in a court and learning the ropes here. That's my personal view. Now what suggestions do I make? Because I really sincerely believe that the future is very bright. And I don't mean to flatter my young friends, but let me tell you, when I see all of you and I see your grasp, your ability to use the internet, your ability to pick up subjects very fast, I really feel that the much better days are ahead. I can say, Ache din are ahead of us. And now, what are the solutions which I think I should do? Because I've been giving part-time lectures in various law colleges. Dr. Vaidya Subhan is there. I've been, I've been once or twice to his place. Ingat Raman goes more often than me. Now, three points I want to mention. First is we must stop any more law colleges. There are just too many law colleges. Yes. 
And what's happened is every state wants to have a national law school. If you read the Times of India about two weeks ago, there is some Chhatrapati Shahu University in UP. I don't know, Chhatrapati Shahu is from my Maharashtra state. What he's doing in UP, God knows. But there is Chhatrapati Shahu University in Uttar Pradesh, which has started 88 law colleges in the last four years. 88. Now, physically, there are not enough lecturers for these law, law colleges. And if you, I don't know how many of your law students, if you read the judgment of uh, Yashpal versus uh, Center for Science, they had a mushrooming of universities. At one time, there used to be a number of universities, and there would be a university which was just above one tea shop. There will be a university board, you'll get a degree and you move on. So I do not know whether the Bar Council is paying sufficient attention to regulating the law schools. One thing we must remember, with quantity, quality always suffers. The reason why chartered accountants as a profession are far more competent, far more disciplined is because the threshold of passing is very, very high. So unless you have, why was the ICS coveted? Why is the IAS coveted? Why is the IIT coveted? Because not everybody can get there. So the moment you have quantity, quality will suffer. So I think the immediate need is to have perhaps a PIL to check up on all these mushrooming law colleges, shut them down if they are not competent enough. In any way, place an embargo for at least next five years, no new law colleges at all. For example, for the life of me, I don't know why we need a law, national law school in Sri Rangam just because the chief minister's constituency in Sri Rangam. I mean, suppose you're from Port Blair, are you going to start a national law school in Port Blair? I don't know the logic. You could might as well develop the Madras Law College, which is such a fine place next to the High Court. So the first point I'll make is no more law colleges. Second point, and which is the most unfortunate part of our legal education, and luckily I was one of the last beneficiaries of the system, is the system of part-time lecturers. Go to any great lawyer. Do you know that Justice Chandrachud, the senior, was a part-time lecturer? Palkiwal was a part-time lecturer? Anil Divan was a part-time lecturer? In Bombay, the government law colleges starts at 7 o'clock in the morning. The first set is 7 to 10. And then there is a day college. And many, many successful lawyers go there, take lectures, and then go to practice. And students get the benefit of that. When I was a student, the reason why at least I know some law is because there are outstanding lawyers who used to come to law college because the high court is just next to the law college. Just cross the gate and you're in the law college. And all the important subjects, contracts, evidence, constitution, was taught by practicing lawyers. For some reason, I do not know, they've discontinued that thing and only people who are full-time academics teach the law. I don't know if I'm wrong, but I think medicine and law, at least some of the subjects, are better taught by practitioners. A CRPC, a criminal procedure code or an Indian penal code will be better taught by a practicing criminal lawyer than by a pure person who is academic. Of course, there are subjects like jurisprudence, legal history, which can be taught by academicians. But many law subjects which are daily practiced in the courts must be tracked by, uh, taught by practicing lawyers, in my view. Last thing I wanted to mention was, uh, there is not enough research publication. I'm on the editorial board of uh, Supreme Court cases, but we hardly get any articles. In the law faculties, I think all of us agree there are very, very little research publications. It should perhaps be made mandatory that unless you publish X number of papers, you will not get your tenure, you will not get your permanency. I've also been trying to tell these law, school, uh, law journals that have a price system. Give cash prizes to attract lectures. In fact, I'll tell you one thing. The Venkataman mentioned that we have very good national law schools which are competent. Now, in the Palkiwala Trust, we every year we conduct an essay competition. And this year we had an essay competition on arbitration, which we just finished in Delhi. And all the three prizes, top class essays, did not come from the main law, national law schools, but from the other law schools. So there are equally uh, good lawyers in other law schools who may not be able to get in into the admission because just by a fraction of a mark you miss the subject, but that doesn't mean you're competent enough. You can still do well. And law is one subject which is un no, it's not unforgiving. If you miss getting into a top law school, there's no need to lose heart. You can still work extremely hard and make up because David Ogilvy said, if you're half as good but work twice as hard, you'll go four <laughs> times as far. So I would tell two things. These three points I mentioned about no more law schools, have part-time lectures, have more thing towards research publication. And to all those of you who want to pursue a legal career, 
you can certainly do so it is still a very very important thing there is enough room at the top and just remember one thing there are mathematical rules which apply to every profession we talk of you know we generally say good old days all standards are gone down the usual thing which i don't agree is standards are gone down all good old days are there you know everything is and that's the standard from plato if you read that plato's thing there is a very beautiful passage where he says students don't have any interest now all are interested in drinking and going out with girls and so on that is in 2000 bc so the same thing continues if you read 1930 air the journal section that author bunsen agarwal writes in 1930 standards are gone down lawyers are not studying all the good old days are there so we keep on lamenting the good old days and say that the present is wrong that is not true at all every generation will have 10 or 15% top class lawyers you left what 40 50% of average lawyers and you left 10 15% of useless lawyers or lawyers who are not doing well at all this is a general makeup in medicine architecture everywhere it's a human nature so we can't just judge an era by the top 10 people who are practicing see the thing as a whole and believe me in many many cases i just asked my interns to tell me what are the plus and minus points uniformly all have told me that today there is much better infrastructure in almost all the law colleges there are adequate budgets for libraries the buildings are better the infrastructure is good they only lament two things that they want more specialized faculty and they would like practicing lawyers to come and teach them so with this i will wish all of you all the best and those of you who want to practice law i would say please do so it's a great profession and to my mind i will not change my profession for all the money in the world it's a fascinating fabulous profession thanks so now i think we can open up uh, the panel for some questions but uh, i have actually one question which i'd like to get your views you uh, mr venkatraman you mentioned that um, you know law students should spend more time in court uh, during their uh, uh, law school uh, education and i i mean this is something that i totally agree that uh, you know they should spend more time in court because moot courts are not exactly what prepares them they should like the uh, in medical school you actually go to a hospital uh, you know law students need to go to court so would there be uh, you know should shouldn't we uh, you know uh, start some you know clinical programs where actually law students can assist lawyers in ongoing cases in some way or basically go to court in some way mr datar and uh, mr venkatraman see <coughs> uh, moot court is not a bad idea uh, for the reason it encourages a student to acquire the tools of opening up a law and uh, you see for in 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 his university there's a professor full time professor to train people in moot courts there's a full time professor and uh, he motivates he really motivates children so it's an asset moot court is something which which is which is good it it gives them the experience without having to fail in, in a big way so that way it's good but uh, as you said in fact me and vaidya we share one one dream it hopes it hope it comes true one day after all most of the court hearings are public open hearings so sensitive constitutional issues sensitive crime issues wherever it happens whether it's high court or supreme court we should have a live when we do parliament sessions live day in and day out most of them don't watch at all but we should find a live coverage of import only then you will see how judges react how do they it's we we stood for four weeks before a nine judge myself datar and other senior counsel and every day was fascinating every day was puzzling every day was baffling end of the day we will come back and say what we did for the whole day after several years of experience this is what we confront so we should allow court important court cases to be screened to law institutions so you should not see we, sh we should adapt ourselves to this uh, digital technology it need not necessarily be 7 to 10 academic timings we should all suit this to ensure that people end of the day acquire knowledge the last one as you were saying you people are now all the students from from, from the first year go for intern for a, for about 3 weeks 4 weeks in every semester i don't think that works in fact as that i will be inviting not we have lot of interns everybody gets lot of interns 
they should work for a schedule of at least three months with somebody, not three weeks. It doesn't make, serve any purpose. So you must have the system in such a way that between, say, October, November, December, or between March, April, May, whenever court functions, active time, those three months from the third year, the children should be doing intern. You need a 90 days internship in an year. Otherwise, it's not going to be fruitful. These are the three suggestions I thought I should give. Yeah, I agree with Venkatraman. In fact, uh, now in England, they have started screening the uh, UK Supreme Court proceedings. And those of you who can go to the Supreme Court website, you can't download it, but you can see, for example, Brexit. Should UK come out of the EU or not? Fascinating argument before the Supreme Court. Beautifully done. It's one hour and 40 minutes. You can see it. So that's a good idea to uh, have, like, Lok Sabha proceedings. And we, of course, more discipline in court. <laughs> so uh, you can hear that. As far as in this uh, interns coming to court and following court proceedings rather than moot proceedings, uh, there's one difficulty which happens now. When I was a junior in the 80s, you start a sessions case on a Monday, there was no a criminal trial or say 302 murder case, there'll be no adjournments. And I remember my senior going to Trichy or E Road and so on, the case starts on a Monday, non-stop it goes on to Saturday. So that's a great learning experience because you have people coming on a Monday, the accused, investigating officer, doctor, everybody is examined, arguments take place, and the whole thing gets over in six days flat. Unfortunately, now what happens is you start a trial on Monday, then it's adjourned again after a month and so on. So this question of an intern going to court, he may not be able to follow one case, but I make it a point to tell my interns that you must spend the time in court. From 10 to 5, you must sit. Keep a notebook with you. You'll find senior lawyers arguing. Keep making notes. If they cite some case, note it down, come back and read what it is. And it's all we learn, the experience we learn from our seniors. They become our role models. We try to imitate the best in them. I would agree that, yes, you must go to court. And Venkatraman's point is well taken. Maybe three months is a good time. I don't know how all law schools are going to adjust to that. But I say even four weeks. I find one thing. That's the fact of life. You can't help it. But to say that the poor don't, that's also uh, not correct. The other which all my criminal lawyer friends tell me is the biggest problem they face is the trial by media. We're speaking at New Indian Express. They say that if it's an Arushi case, then even before the trial starts, they have completely decided who is guilty. In fact, I was shocked to see in Times of India, there was a report, this, who is this uh, recent lady who that, uh, uh, Shishira Bano, that chap, the Peter, uh, Peter, uh, star, star TV chap? Huh? Shina, yes, and Peter Mukherjee, yes, star. Times when it says, our investigation team has found. I mean, who's Times when to investigate? Investigation is by the police. So, and there was a report that when the Arushi murder took place in the Hindi channels, 72% of the TV time was spent on Arushi. And I believe before the TV channels also destroyed a lot of evidence by going into the place and making all sorts of things. So, it's, I, I appreciate your concern, but it is not always true that the Sanjay Dutts and the Salman Khans get better off. There are a lot of people who get convicted also. I'll See what happened to our chief minister. Yeah. <laughs> I'll add a sentence uh, because you're a young child asking this. Uh, you, we must go to the root of the issue. See, democracy, the foundations of democracy is compromise, tolerance, and persuasion. Democracy stands on these legs. We must understand that. So you will have aberrations in any society, but aberrations are always an exceptions. As a child, you should... You should you should not be influenced by aberrations. You have, as he rightly puts it, there are still good courts. There are still good judgments. So we should hope that we should work towards that and be part of that college. Okay? Good luck. Thank you, sir. Uh, very good evening to the panel. My name is Raja Ram, and uh, I'm currently pursuing the three-year law program from Delhi University. Uh, my question is about the three-year law colleges. Uh, both, both the panelists spoke about, in fact, all the three panelists spoke about uh, the five-year colleges. Uh, there seems to be apathy towards the three-year colleges. And uh, is there anything done or if you are aware of uh, whether it might be phased out or what's, what's going to happen with three-year law colleges and whether did they actually need any kind of uh, refurbishment? Had the Minister of Law, State of Law, to be here to answer your question. But see, at least I don't see a difference. The difference between five-year and three-year, in fact, Bakshi, there is a lot of reports, Professor Bakshi, Mother Menon, they've all worked out to ensure social subjects are added in the first two years to mold you. That's the, that's the whole idea of a five-year law college. And the, 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 from third, fourth, fifth year, the same legal subjects are retained. Okay. So 
you you are this is the this is flip side if you see the upside of a 3 year you are more mature to take law because you are graduated i would now suggest if there are youngsters 12th standard 11th standard students i would suggest in fact i made that mistake with not knowing it if you are an engineering discipline if you are a maths physics chemistry student do a good engineering course and then do law you have a brightest future hereafter engineering and law is going to be a good area of practice for the next 3 decades that's a combination so don't worry about 3 year or 5 year you should be a successful lawyer yeah. and I, in fact i want to add um, i mean there are very few 3 year law colleges um left you know which are offering the uh, uh, the course and i i agree i think you know uh, from the three year three year law colleges i think students come out uh, having a better first degree because you've done a ba or bcom or bsc and that's a much more intense and a better degree because i think sometimes in the five year course the ba part is not taught that well um and i think you know we find uh, students who come out of the three year course in fact much more better equipped to uh, take up law because they've done a graduation uh, i think some of your programs i don't know whether you have a full day kind of program or just like the government law college where you just have a morning session it gives you also the opportunity to do a lot more kind of practice work during your uh, part time practice work during your three year program which would actually be extremely beneficial so i would actually say that it should not go the three year program should be there it offers a lot of people who've not thought of law initially to actually take up law you know because otherwise you're stuck you have to do the whole five year program again uh, well if you ask me frankly i think this five years a, were a very very big mistake they have made i am a great votary for three year law school you must have a basic degree and then go i very often feel a student at 17 18 is not able to make up his mind and he takes up law school my son is if he is also from a law school so i know i think it's better in fact if you do a bcom degree and then do law you're much better off doing commercial matters taxation matters if you're a science graduate and this chance of trademark patent law is better i think that the old pattern was the best because i've seen both sides a basic degree and perhaps you should have the bgl in those days fundamental two year course in law and the third year all elective subjects you can choose labor law industrial law taxation law combined with apprenticeship that was the best possible thing but anyway i think fire is come to stay but don't worry don't feel bad i think you're better off yes uh, good afternoon uh, my name is kavya shrikumar i study in mop vaishnav college for women and i'm a journalism student uh, my question is to you ma'am in your speech you had mentioned that many lawyers want to take won't take up legal aid law because it's not as lucrative as corporate law is there any model that you would suggest that would make them take it up like an incentivization or perhaps for corporate law lawyers to take up community service hours just like how we college students are asked to do the same thing perhaps they could do that side by side would there be any incentivization or model that you propose as a solution for this problem i think that's a very important question and i think we should start really uh, looking at some of these issues yes there can be uh, different forms of incentivization i think um in the us some corporate law firms do pro bono work um and they consider it uh, they do it free of cost because the corporate firm is able to withstand it uh because of their high earnings and they do it as a ma as a matter of uh pride and interest to do pro bono work and they encourage some of their associates to do it uh, but we don't have that kind of culture uh, in india uh, we have a legal services authority which actually takes on on their panel uh, lawyers for legal aid uh, work but they are paid so poorly that most uh, lawyers young lawyers who would want work in their initial years would not even think of doing it because you would get a paltry 500 rupees uh, it's not that our legal services boards don't have enough funds they can certainly pay better they can screen lawyers better so that uh, this becomes something worthwhile and also becomes something of prestige you know it should be it should be recognized that you're doing important public interest work unfortunately today even the handful of uh, legal aid lawyers who do this work are actually not uh their work is not appreciated and it's not seen in a positive way um so it's got uh you know the legal aid services panel has got not a very good reputation because it's got a reputation of lawyers who are not doing the work well who are really having no other practice i think there should be other forms of incentivization as well um you know we now you also have in india a lot of organizations ngos which are able to get support 
to do uh, public interest work, where they can pay young lawyers well to do rights-based work, uh, which many years ago was not possible. Today, I mean, earlier in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, either you do litigation, where you join a senior, or you join a, a solicitor firm. Today, you also have the option where you have a lot of organizations uh, which are supported and funded and which can hire lawyers to do public interest work and pay them reasonably well. So, uh, but I certainly think that there has to be some incentivization. The incentivization has to be across the legal system. Um, and I think further, I think in the courts and in the legal profession, people who do legal aid work and who do public interest work have to be recognized as doing work that is uh, seen to be uh, really of worth. Today, unfortunately, in our courts, we have a sense in, within the, uh, both in the bar and the judiciary, that someone who does really good corporate work is seen in a very positive light. You don't have the same way uh, uh, public interest lawyers who do public interest work are not seen in the same way. So we have to change the way we look at people who do public interest work if we want this kind of work to increase. Sir, good evening, Venkatraman, sir. A question to you. You told that you should be uh, telecasted. Instead of that, uh, I would like to know whether all the law schools in India have been integrated through website so that they can conduct a webinar, live cast, so that the students can make themselves. Number one, this is my part A question. And my part B question is, after 2000, IT Act has not been amended, after 1947, I, Industrial Dispute Act, only amendments were made. Factories Act 1948, only amendments were made. All the M MNC companies are having their shop floor here. More migratory workers are in India. In case of crisis, mean if there are no amended laws or no new laws, how are you able to face their uh, problems sir, in case of crisis? IT employees, they do not have any association or any, anything like them, no union to them. In case of crisis, mean if there is no law means, there is no clear-cut law says that uh, in case of IT industry goes on strike, how to face them. How you are you going to face as a lawyer, sir? It is my part B question. I have no disagreement on your first question, webinar. See, these are all details. We just thought, suggesting a couple of things. But uh, we should expose our children to more of uh, these experiences which you can now relate it and connect it through uh, a digital world. That's okay. As far as the second question is concerned, of course, I'm not a domain expert in labor law. Have, have had a, a few experiences of friends, friends, spouses, and all those things getting into IT issues. The labor law in the country and the shop attack, all these enactments, they deal IT company cases also the same way they deal any other uh, white-collared uh, offense or white-collared mistake. So ultimately, Employer-employee relationship is the doctrine of pleasure. If an employee is sacked, you have ombudsman. All those things are there in IT companies. But ultimately, it's all lined up to ensure that the management's decision is final. So fighting against the management, you will, you will be sidelined in your, progressive, in your progress as an individual. So it's a challenge which every individual mind has to take, whether to fight or to give it up and then go and change jobs. It's like any other employment opportunity as far as laws are concerned. This is my basic understanding out of three, four experiences. I'm not an expert in this field, but this is my answer to your question. It is concerning, but this is how it is getting handled as a matter of fact. Uh, this is just a, a popular uh, statement. I wish it isn't true. Um, you know, there is this, uh, somebody said, you know, I argued the fourth matter in the first court and the first matter in the fourth court and managed to get a stay in both. So, but the message that I got was, this was some persuasion skills of the lawyer who did this. Uh, and uh, so you were talking about advocacy and both of you have, uh, you know, contributed a lot, successful lawyers. And there are so many of us here who want to know if you want to pick the, the topmost uh, advo advocacy skill that's made you what you are today, what would you pick, Mr. Venkatraman and Mr. Datta? Advocacy skills, because today it's about skills. So what would you think is the topmost 
that made the difference for both of you? I'll, I'll just say one or two only. See, ultimately, it's a mind game and a time game, sir. I've seen it out of my experience, especially in a long matter. So, how do you time it? And what's the mood of the judge and the court at a given point of time? Molding yourself to the mood. But basically, these corporate laws are all quite standardized. You can't influence like a criminal trial or anything in a big way. Swing this way after that way. The, the, the options are really limited. But even within that, a judge can take a call one way or the other. So molding yourself to the frame, framework of the judge's thought process is all about advocacy. Because you have to win the matter using the correct uh, principles of law, number one. Now, number two, he was saying one and four and four and one. I think he would have exper he's experiencing, I'm experiencing, all of us are experiencing it. Same matter sometimes gets part heard thri thrice or four times before different benches. And uh, it's, it's a matter of fact. Every time, every court appreciates the same case differently. <laughs> it's, it's an experience. So, uh, it, it's now especially where there is a discretion vested in a court. Uh, whether you, your, your type of thinking matters. A Vodafone judgment would have been an impossibility in the same Supreme Court had it been before any other bench. I can challenge it. It's only because somebody who knows chartered accountancy, somebody who knows economics, somebody knows what is investment market circle, you could get a Vodafone judgment. So same if it has gone before judges who have a socialistic bent of mind, you would not have got the judgment this way. It's a chance. Ultimately, it's a chance. Yeah, to answer your question, you know, you said that uh, the same case of one lawyer, why advocacy skill matters. But this is not now, if you read Cicero, what does Cicero say so many years? He said, if truth was self-evident, eloquence would be unnecessary. So very often, the... And I've seen as a youngster, I've seen Ram Jetpilani argue, I've seen X argue. There's a world of a difference. Ultimately, it's the art of persuasion. In fact, in the Palkiwala book, they say the judge would reserve judgment for two days because he would be in a state of hypnosis after listening to him. So he wanted to be calm and then write the judgment. So ultimately, I think it's just the skill of persuasion and uh, how to put your point. Secondly, again, it depends from court to court. When you've got half an hour, how to select the best two points. We have read books on advocacy. There's an American, leading American lawyer. He calls it a technique of spotlighting. He said, ultimately, in any case, there are two or three focal points which will swing the case this way or that. So that your skill lies in analyzing that point and then deciding the case. So, so many examples are there where by sheer advocacy you can do. I just read a biography of Marshall Hall, one of the greatest uh, jury lawyers. He was, he was almost an actor. F.E. Smith, Lord Birkenhead, he used to write his entire arguments, rehearse them, and then put it. So just the sheer skill of persuading a person to say something, that's, that's really matter. It's unfortunate, but that's true. Ultimately, it all depends on how you present. The same points, A, B, C, said by me will mean something, said by another great lawyer will mean something else. He may win the case, I may not win the case. Huh? Uh, Uh, no, I think these are all slightly exaggerations. Yeah, no, these are high exaggeration that you just go to court and uh, without knowing the case, you go and argue. This is not true at all. Believe me, on, on important days, we don't sleep before midnight because you're preparing for a case. If I could just say this, I mean, I, <laughs> I would be in a much different place. But there, but there are, there, there, there is a period where uh, Doyen's first item one will be a rent control matter for the landlord. Item 8, not different court, same court, same day, item 8, rent control matter for the tenant. Both you will get a stay. It has happened. It's not that. But, well, we have, we have evolved out of it today. That much is sure. <laughs> Hi. Hi, all. My name is Pranit Reddy. And I have a question regarding to Right to Education Act. And uh, I believe Right to Education and Act and Gramini Alias Act are most beautiful acts in the country and least bothered also. So government, the judiciary is being stepped into a vacuum of governance and I don't know how this crisis will resolve. There is no implementation of Right to Education Act in this country and even from 2010 to 2015, the number of cases in Supreme Court related to Right to Education Act are 49% of access to education 
and even supreme court we have 49% means in the local governance the centralization is not full of centralization no, sorry it's not true right to education act is being implemented in fact i argued the case we lost it in the supreme court we said some provisions are not correct but right to education act 60% of the right no. to education act about 25% no, students free of cost that is being implemented in school after school i don't know what, what i think you may be referring to is since the court since the supreme court exempted the you know the supreme court has exempted certain minority schools from uh, you know uh, coverage of the right no, to education there are so many litigations in the That's supreme in the court act. that was because of litigation but in other cases the right to education act is being implemented then we don't have local courts like gram and ila so that is not that but i think the issue here is on legal education and how we can um, you know strengthen legal education so if we could take up some questions on that sorry i come to the stage here because i have been a teacher and my son is also an advocate our the subject was which is very clear here do our law schools produce world class lawyers and mr data he said yes but he didn't elaborate there because he is saying that we have got how many 80000 advocates in chennai only in chennai in tamil nadu no tamil 90 says it produce world class lawyers but not enough how many pardon me how many in 17 lakhs 17 lakh 17 lakh advocates are there even then we have got 28 million cases pending in the courts is it because of the low quality of judges or the low quality of advocates or though there are not many ram jethmani arvind data or venkat raman to argue the cases so this is basic question is everybody talking about pendency of cases but nobody is giving the answer why but i am completing question that client for the be- wants the best lawyer everybody wants arvind arvind want venkatraman everybody wants ari salve why we don't have duplicate ram jethmani triplicate arvind datar fourth time mr venkatraman because there is only one arvind datar there one ram jethmani it means we don't have even national class lawyers who can argue to the satisfaction of the clients so obviously our law schools are not producing advocates in which the clients should have pay because their teaching shops are there and that as they say it is it is one of the most cheapest education investment in education is less but return in this profession is the highest you spend only 7 to 8 lakh rupees year on education law education and you earn that 7 to 8 lakh rupees in most of the educates some of them in one in a half a day there are many who earn in one day there are other who are earning one month so whatever you invest in law education you get it back in one month so this is the cheapest thing therefore you have got a lot of supply but clients are still suffering it's the most cost of litigation is the highest but the world class educators are missing because that is the question we want to raise pendency of delivery of justice in this country is delayed because of the judges because of the advocates or because of the infrastructure i want both of you to give a short answer and yes. be frank with it yes yes i i'll, I'll just because uh, of the adjournments we cases are pending most of the time yes. every day i see so many adjournments that happening no I, i'll just answer one thing why is one is issue of pendency and the other issue of competence on the issue of pendency the simple answer is we have the lowest judge to uh, population ratio we have only 11 judges per million whereas the united nation norm is 100 judges per million in 19 2002 the supreme court said that you must have at least bring it up to 50 judges per million but that has still not been done after so many we still now we have got some 13.7 judges per million so one is a chronic shortage of judges secondly if you take the percentage of expenditure on judiciary it's i think 0.6% or 0.4% of our gdp whereas in the uk it is 6 to 7% of the gdp so one reason is just pure lack of infrastructure you all know that we have got a sanction strength of about 1000 high court judges and 40% shortage is there so if you have less number of judges you are going to have direction lesser number of disposal so pendency is partly because of lack of the total number of judges secondly the other reason pendency is wherever the litigant is the government they will fight every case good bad up to the supreme court today i was talking to judge most of the cases in the lower courts are 
check bouncing cases and domestic violence cases. They said we don't have time to do a 302 murder case, to do a grievous hurt case, to do a theft case. In fact, people are saying police are not registering FIRs for these offenses because there is no court. The entire time is taken in check bouncing. Nowhere in the world check bouncing is an offense. We have made it an offense. So 40% of our cases are check bouncing. The remaining 40% are domestic violence. So this, that's one thing. As far as world class, why you can't have double Jitpana, etc., that will never happen. Otherwise, there will not be Ram Jitpana here at all. But I'm just saying that over the years, if you say as a percentage, I think today there are far more percentage of competent lawyers. You may just hear of one Palkiola, one Salve. There are so many other people who are very good who are not heard in the public domain. And they are doing wonderful work. They are the unsung heroes. I have a different... I, I, am, I am Dr. Hanifa Ghosh from principal of CTT College. Just one question which has always intrigued me. Excuse it's me, about... ma'am. Before you uh, ask your question, we have our panelist who is also adding on to the previous question. So if you would just wait for a bit, we'll also hear okay, his sure. thoughts. I'm yes. sorry about that. Yes. I'll just take two minutes. <clears throat> I have a different perception on dispendency because I worked on it and a paper for the National Judicial Academy for Judges. When I did the research, it was uh, the, what featured ultimately in analysis is we are actually burdening the courts. It's non-disposal is one, one, one part of it. It is the executive who is the biggest litigant today in the country. On what eight of the ten issues which need not be either issues or something which they could have resolved it themselves, they have now pushed it to the courts. So you burden the court eight or ten times more and extract, say that you have not produced results, whether it is justified. It is something. So it's an alignment of all the three bodies. If mu they must talk it out. They must sort it out. It's, you don't identify only judiciary and then point out to say pendency is because of you. This mismatch can considerably reduce pendency. One. Two, multiple high courts are deciding the same issue. For example, if it's an ATA exemption, when one high court puts it, transfer it to a bunch all the cases to one high court. Why should 10 different high courts hear 10 different benches for six days? These are all small things which we can do. We can add value and reduce standard. Within the limitation of the allotment, all those resources constraint will be there. A meaningful reduction, some semblance of a result can be brought out if we do course correction in this way. And on competence, it's a matter of personal ethics. I have been in Delhi for the past five years. It's my commitment. I normally don't take a second matter. If I take it, it has to be in the same court or in the same vicinity. It's a matter of ethics. That's all. If you, if you, if you commit for three places and you make your client swing where he will be at a time, people chase. That's different. But you have to uh, decide where to draw a line. And uh, more number of people are emerging, sir. In next 10 to 15 years, as Datta predicts, finds it out. You will... Because now clients are people tolerated, clients tolerated. Now clients are not willing to tolerate. Because they say, we want your time and we are paying you. Therefore, they want to extract. So there is now a mismatch which is slowly getting uh, filled up. 10 to 15 years, you will see the difference. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The last question for this session, ma'am, very quickly. Thank you. I'm Dr. Hanifa Ghosh, principal of CTT College. I've always been intrigued by this question, uh, by the ethics of this profession, does a lawyer need to be convinced of the innocence of his client before he takes up a case? I will, we will uh, we'll bask on the statement of uh, our uh, Bhishma Pita, who K. Parasaran, sir. It is always good to remain ethical. Let's be clear. But for every golden rule, there are golden exceptions. Sometimes you are fraught with those exceptions. But as a lawyer, you still fight your case only under the principles of law. I think none of us would have fudged because we all belong to... See, what motivates you? Ultimately, your senior motivates you. My senior uh, judges have never opened the bundle when he stood up and spoke. So that's something which has inspired me as a youngster. So, because he was ethical. So, you fight even... A case on law, I think it is permissible under the under the under the terminology advocacy. I just answer your question because my senior was a leading criminal lawyer. First of all, the moment you decide, then you step into the role of a judge. You're a lawyer. Suppose you got a case of murder, 
you know the client has murdered. But then you see, are there any exceptions? Your duty is not to make any false statement, not to make any false records. But was it grave and sudden provocation? Was he mentally stable at that point of time? So whatever defenses are available to you in law, you can always uh, put forth. So even if your client is, because everybody is entitled to a defense, even the most criminal has some redeeming feature, you can try to put that and mitigate the sentence. Instead of death, you can bring it to life or bring it to 10. You can convert 302 into grievous hurt. You can do by just putting forth the best possible thing. See, a person may commit murder with grave and sudden provocation. That's not a ground to convict him. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that ends our panel discussion. A big hand to our panelists. Thank you very, very much. I think we asked the question to our law schools produced world-class lawyers and we discussed a whole gamut of uh, things and learned a lot from you as well, starting from the curriculum and the kind of courses that are available to the need for practical education, so on and so forth. Thank you very, very much for joining us. May I request Mr. Prabhu Chavla to kindly join us on stage and felicitate our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, we have one last session, our special session, with a very, very special eminent person. So please kindly stay back for that. We're going to start immediately. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and making this session all the more entertaining and invigorating. Thank you very, very much.